Good afternoon, Professor Powell, and it's nice to meet you. Uh, thank you very much also for joining me today, and I hope everything's been safe with you. Um, I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Noah Radwanski, and I'm a public relations associate here at Vogel Zang Law. Vogel Zang Law is an asbestos litigation law firm. We've been around for a handful of years now, and our lead counsel, Nicholas Vogel Zang, has over 20 years experience in asbestos litigation. Um, you know, our staff here is very family centric and the environment that has been created here, it's really awesome. And we spend a great deal amount of time getting to know our clients. And, you know, that leads me to the point of why I actually had reached out to you and why I wanted to sit down with you today. Um, your background is quite extensive and you have knowledge in several topics. Um, so with that being said, Professor, do you mind uh, introducing yourself and going into a little bit about what you do? So, uh, I've been at the Kelly School of Business for 24 years, PhD in economics from Vanderbilt. Um, I'm an econo economics, economics economist by training. I guess I've sort of taught and re researched in health economics, US economy, um, emerging markets, um, taught in all of our MBA programs. I've been chair of three of our MBA programs on both the Indianapolis and Bloomington campuses. And now I'm associate dean, reporting to our dean, and I oversee our, our outreach, community outreach development, but more importantly, our academic programs in Indianapolis. And uh, yeah, and live here in Indiana, live in Indianapolis, uh, but, but again, I worked, of my four, 24 years, probably worked eight years in Bloomington. Nice. Well, as a, a former Indiana Hoosier, I'm glad you're on our side. Hey, there you go. You know, you're being a little humble when it comes to your experience. So luckily for our audience, I, I had gone through your portfolio. Um, but, you know, the fashion in which you've brought it up and your knowledge is depth. And, you know, your experience in business and economics, public policy. Um, you actually didn't mention healthcare. Do you mind if you go into a little bit about your expertise in that realm? Sure. So in healthcare, I've uh, focused on policy and, and, and management decision making. Uh, one of the best things I do as a faculty member at, at the Kelly School is teach um, in our physician MBA program. And it's teaching about leadership, but also economic decision making. Uh, part of that program is to sort of re we call it replace the suits with the white coats. Now we want, you know, the best run hospitals and health systems are run by physicians. And um, that, is, you know, healthcare is, is the most broken, it's the most important industry in, 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 in the U.S. economy, not only in terms of the value it creates, but its size, but it's also the most broken. One out of every three healthcare dollars, the literature shows, is waste. So that's $1.2 trillion of bad decision making. That's 6% of GDP. If we can educate physicians to make better business decisions, in the interest of the patient, uh, the system is going to be uh, saved and, and improved. We think so. But my background is in terms of healthcare is is help to equip our physicians to make these better decisions, whether it's leadership or, or better understanding their economic environment. Yeah, and you just mentioned how wanting to bring suit coats into white coats and kind of implementing that into hospitals. You know, I haven't been around too long, but I know the importance right now of the. Uh, industries of healthcare in our business world communicating. Um, so, with that being said, do you have any insight into how the healthcare industry is communicating with the business realm? And how has the healthcare system been upended as a result of uh, COVID 19? I think that COVID 19, you know, if you think about 9 11, our big, understandably, our big obsession coming out of 9 11, the terrorist attacks of 2011, 2001 was security and uh, you know, terrorism. And as a country, we spent trillions of dollars on improving our, our responsiveness on that it related to foreign policy. Coming out of this, I think our new national obsession is gonna be population health. I think that COVID-19 lays waste to a healthcare system that uh, divorces wellness from actual healthcare delivery. Your best performing healthcare systems are those that are vertically integrated between delivery and insurance. 
And unfortunately now we've got a situation where our most profitable parts of our industry are not in the part that makes sense, but that counts the most and that's in, 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 in care delivery. Um, so I think what you're gonna see in healthcare is a realignment of that, um, where the, you know, there's a real contrast in seeing our healthcare providers on the front lines, short of masks, short of, of, of protection equipment, um, you know, putting their lives on the line, fighting the battles to save lives in the rooms and ICUs. And you've got your executives in the insurance and even the healthcare industry sort of you're working safely from their home like I am right now, wearing where, where their, their, their the sweatshirt of their, of, of their employer. Uh, and, and that just doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't sit well. You know, physicians are not, and so, and some physicians are, are not getting paid, they've gotten their salaries reduced. And so there's this, this, this misalignment in healthcare that I think is going to, there's going to be better alignment coming out of this. There's going to be more healthcare resources. There's going to be more physicians. The education infrastructure and the public health infrastructure will increase. It will be expensive, but I don't think as a country we're going to want to live through this again and the scare of, of not being able to have enough ventilators. That's not an issue of bad medicine. That's an issue of bad management. Bad management at what level? Just, it's a, it's a broken system, right? Misaligned incentives. Um, and it's, it's where the profit motive, and I'm saying this as a business professor, right? You know, the universe of choices that are ethical from a business perspective are much larger than the universe of choices that are ethical from a healthcare perspective. And when you have business people running the healthcare system, there's gonna be this misalignment. And physicians are trained to focus on the patient. And so if they ran the system, which I think this is gonna give them an opportunity to do, um, then well, there's gonna be alignment between what's ethical from a medical perspective and what's good management. Right now, the business people are making management decisions and it's putting both patients and, and, the, and the healthcare providers at risk. And it's leading to worse healthcare. The problem with healthcare is you make money, not necessarily if you deliver better healthcare. There's got to be better alignment there. I'm glad you brought that up because you kind of touched on some of the positives that will result in all of this. Um, and I'll bring it up later on and I'd like to discuss that because there's so much negativity. It is nice to get insight and you know perspective from you, a professor, on kind of how things can get better. Um, not just in terms of having the containment of the virus, but also how we live as a society. And, you know, that also includes effectively running hospitals and putting the decision-making of those people in those situations in the hands of people who would be able to handle them. You kind of touched up on how has COVID-19 impacted uh, the IU community, IUPUI community, and what adjustments to the university, and I'm assuming you also played a role in the decision-making uh, that went on as the virus spread. Sure, I, I wanna, I'm, a, I'm very proud of Indiana University. We're a, we're a university of, as you know, as an alum, nine campuses, over 100,000 students, and we have moved online in pretty good fashion. I had a privilege before this position of, of of being chair of our online graduate programs at the Kelly School of Business, which we were able to take to number one in the country. And we couldn't take it to number one in the country in US News without really good faculty that know how to teach online. And so uh, it's been great to see our internal investment in that pay off. And as a school, as a, as a school of business, we've been able to seamlessly move online to serve 12,000 students without being in our in our buildings. Uh, we make that movement pretty quickly and we've been able to help the rest of the university. Um, and a lot of it is about reminding our faculty that the change, and I know a lot of organizations are facing this, that there's a real fear when you have to do things differently and do it suddenly, right? There's a lot of anxiety. So I think the role of our leadership at Indiana University has to be, then to be able to make sure the resources are there that the technology works, but most importantly, to, to uh, support and to uh, reaffirm our faculty and their ability to get through this, to give them confidence, to know they know that we have confidence in them. 
And by doing that, they're able to overcome their fear and they've really gone, they're, they're, they're in there delivering great teaching for our students so their students can move on with their lives. Because at, at the end of the day, you know, our students may be locked, you know, at home, away from their dorms, away from Bloomington, away from our, whatever campus you're from, isolated, but their professional development can still continue as a student. And we have an obligation to continue to deliver that so that while they may be, while COVID-19 might put a timeout on economic activity right now, it doesn't put a timeout on the development of our students so that when this is all over, they're ready to add value in the new economy. Absolutely. You know, unfortunately, fortunately for, you know, students, you know, universities have the ability to do what you had just mentioned, go digital and be able to provide that education. Still now there's many occupations out there that aren't having that luxury. And here at Vogel Zang Law, we have a certain sense of responsibility we feel with the connections that we draw with our clients and the network that we have here to be on top of the latest up-to-date information on COVID or anything that would pertain to the health of our clients. And we know that COVID-19 preys on underlying conditions. And with Vogel Zang Law being an asbestos litigation firm, um, a lot of our clients, as I've mentioned, uh, have been exposed to damage in their lungs. Now, asbestos exposure isn't an underlying condition, but it does cause irreversible damage. So what would your recommendation be for people who have occupations and have to do things that aren't allowed to do it digitally, that have to go out into the, into the society and, and fulfill those jobs and uh, any safety tips that you would be able to provide to them or uh, insight into family, friends, uh, assistance that they could be providing? Well, I'll, I'll preface by saying I'm not a public health expert, so I can give some economic advice perhaps. This is a tough, this is a tough time, especially if you cannot work remotely. Um, and so I think that for those folks, don't be afraid to draw upon the resources that are out there. So um, renegotiating your mortgage, uh, you know, the, the, the advice we're giving small businesses right now is this is just about economic survival. If you can wake, if you can finish each day and be solvent and not be bankrupt, that's one day closer to when business comes back. And so I think that mentality uh, translates to work, uh, just individuals in our great land, in, our, in, in Indiana or, or any, any, any community here in the United States right now suffering this is that you can wake, if you can finish each day, and you know you're 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 healthy, and you're it's still in your house, your apartment, or wherever you are. That's a victory, and take each day at a time. Now, the way that you do that economically is, you know, it's like, well, Phil, how do I deal with rent? How do I deal with lease payments? What you'll find is is that creditors, leasing agents, anybody that you owe money to. Are going to be more forgiving than you probably have ever thought of because they have as much interest in you staying solvent as anybody else. So don't be afraid to reach out to those folks um, or draw upon lines of credit to get you through. Um, from a health perspective, obviously you want to follow the guidelines, you know, mask. They say washing your hands can reduce risk by 50%. So, um, so bottom line, live each day at a time, see if you can reduce Look for every way to reduce your cash flow in terms of rene especially renegotiating arrangements that you have with people that you owe money. And just, you know, be very diligent on, on the social distancing guidance that you get from your public health officials. Now, how dependent in your estimation are we on other countries to effectively contain the spread? You know, because there's no guarantee that when we go back out there, this won't arise again, not just as a result of um, the virus being internally within the United States, but also has the ability to be airborne. It can be traveled, uh, transmitted from people traveling from other countries. How, how dependent are we on worldwide cooperation in those guidelines? I think that we are dependent in a lot more ways than people realize. Yes, when you reduce travel into the country, you can better control the virus. 
for example, China has had a, another spike in cases, not because they were domestic, but because people came back to China and China was actually re-importing the sickness. So yes, I think, I think we think in those terms, but you gotta understand our supply chains are global. It's important that we work with global partners because a lot of our, for better or for worse, I think for worse right now, a lot of our medications are made in India and China. And so making sure trade is open is extremely important. So we need to, you know, investing in these global relationships, not, not retreating from them, but actually leaning into them is very important because we, again, the world is a, it's a globalized, whether we like it or not, it is a globalized economy. And things that we take for granted are made tens of thousands, you know, thousands of miles away in another country. So when we start to play political games, those supply chains can break down. The last point I'll make about global dependence is, is that I think the way that we manage this, we can look at other countries and how they're managing it to learn how maybe what we can do here. And, and whether it's looking at, at some of the way, you know, Denmark today, for example, was one of the first countries to open up preschools. What is it that Denmark did that allowed them to do that, right? What is it that Hong Kong did that has allowed them to keep their deaths very low um, and slow, to, slow things down? In Australia, you know, they have less than 200 deaths so far. And I think it has a lot to do too, back to the original point that we made, we were talking about, about the healthcare system, right? There's lessons to learn, not only how you can manage the virus from other countries, but how can we rehabilitate our healthcare system to still retain that free market drive in our healthcare system, but how can we tweak it, learning from other countries to make sure that we don't have this misalignment that's make, making us so vulnerable right now? Yeah, and it seems like the areas you're touching up on extend beyond the virus itself. It seems like you're talking more so about the managerial aspects of how we manage healthcare in America um, at not only government level, but in terms of how the physical hospitals and clinics themselves are ran. This is not, these are not questions of medicine. They're questions, as you say, I mean, I think the one takeaway here, a lot of these failures, is not because we have bad doctors, it's because we have bad managers, right? Who's making these decisions? And what are the incentives that lead to these bad decisions? That needs complete realignment. And that's why, you know, as a country, we always respond to national crises. Although in the middle of the crises, it may feel like we're not gonna change. I promise you that two or three or four years later from now, you know, if you and I were sitting, you know, hopefully sitting across from a, ta a real table, <laughs> uh, that we will, we will see a hustle in the, in the American character that you've never seen on the topic of population health. Just like four years after 9-11 in the early 2000s, we saw a hustle in response to terrorism and national security threats that we've never seen. Yeah, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could focus on individuals and people's health? Um, and that transitions me perfectly into another topic I'd like to discuss and some of the positives that you see out of all this. You know, for example, for me, I use the common theme of spending time with loved ones. I had the opportunity to go home. Uh, I live downtown here in Chicago, and my mom lives up in the northern suburbs, and I've had to spend more time with her. And people all across the country uh, have been connecting with loved ones, family, and friends. Um, is there anything that you are in particular grateful for? Um, and in terms of your perspective as a professor, what are the positives that you see out of all this? You talk about the alignment of hospitals and um, the need to have those run better. Um, is there anything else that you would be able to point to that you could see changing you know, in the future? I'm sure a lot of a lot of your friends of the firm, your clients, you know, if you're in your neighborhood, I'm in a typical middle class neighborhood in Indianapolis and I walk out and I see parents playing with their kids every day, right? These are things we took for granted in the 70s and 80s. You don't see that anymore. You see it now, right? I think that it is, it is, is for many families, it is, it, and I know in my own family, we're spending more time together and we're talking about things more and we're integrating our lives more and we're getting to appreciate everybody more. So I think in some ways this has forced us to slow down and, and, and reconnect. And we're reconnecting because we're physically close, 
but we're also reconnecting, even if it's through Zoom, with your grandparents or parents that you can't, you wouldn't want to talk to because you want to keep them safe. But just, we, we crave human, that human connection because we realize we can't take it for granted anymore. And so I, real, I do think, and I know that at the Kelly School, our staff, our faculty, our strength, of, our sense of community has come closer together. I think that's a natural human reaction that, and that reminder will stay with us a long time. Um, and also I think it re reminds us how resilient we can be. We will get through this. We will look back and have survived uh, as a community, something we never thought we could and done business in ways we never thought we could, right? To move a university on, you know, univer Indiana University moved everything offline or online during spring break. They literally announced that we we're gonna close and be, so be ready when spring break is over, we did it. And so I think that inspires confidence moving forward and it will speed up some of the good change we were seeing uh, in terms of the way technology can help us out. So, you know, I, I am bullish on the good things coming out of this. I think the biggest challenge for all of us, including probably you and me know, is just the day-to-day -day of the uncertainty right now and that mental discipline of, of waking up each day going, okay, this will, be, this will be over. How do I just get through the next day and be thankful for that? Gratitude is one of the seeds of human happiness and that's something to plug into right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're touching into kind of the American spirit of it all that everything is going to be okay, that we're going to return back to our normal lives, that bars and restaurants will reopen, that social distancing will be loosened, and that sporting events will happen again. Um, now that I'll never, is, I'll never take a football game or a beer in a bar to bring it again. Oh, absolutely not. And, you know, being here in Chicago, I can't wait to see my Cubbies. Uh, absolutely. You know, fortunately, um, Hopefully it'll be happening soon. Um, but that kind of makes me think, how's your time, uh, personal touch here, how's your time differed um, under this quarantine? What have you been doing? Um, and how does that differ from your everyday lifestyle? Well, you know, uh, I probably, you know, you, you, actually my work cycle's moved a little later. I think that, um, and I'm taking more time in the afternoon, you know, sitting in front of a computer screen for eight, nine hours is exhausting. And I'm not, I don't want to do my computer anymore. So I'm actually working, you know, my working hours are probably more, more the traditional nine to five. And I'm ready. I spend time with my wife and my, my, my son from college is home. And then I'm more, I'm doing more walking, probably losing a little weight because I'm not eating out as much. I don't, I feel a little helpless not knowing what's going on, but I do feel, you know, like there's more of a routine here in the house. So yeah. Uh, I think my work patterns are, are more reflecting something that's a little bit more humane than, um, you know, a more, a more, tip, a more si typical 60, 70 hour week, which I'm doing because I'm going to events, I'm commuting, I'm, I'm, all, I'm, in, I'm in a rush. I've actually slowed down a little bit um, and I've, I'm more focused. In fact, there's a couple of articles out there that talk about how uh, commute, telecommuting can actually increase your productivity quite a bit, 10, 20, 30 percent. I think I'm seeing that. I'm, I'm, I get the same accomplished, but with less time. And the reason I'm not working is at the end of the day is I just don't want to see a computer screen anymore. And I don't want to watch the news. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Understandable there. I'm, play, I'm playing more games. I'm, 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 I'm making, I'm having more watch and appreciating the outside more. So hopefully uh, you're being able to experience that and a lot of your clients and, 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 and the friends of your firm are, are, are experiencing that also. Yeah, and you know, I hope the weather has been cooperative down there as well. Um, we're limited in terms of what we can do, um, but it's nice to be able to take a walk outside or just even step out on your front porch and just enjoy the limelight for a little bit. Um, I think a lot of us are doing soul searching, so I'm going to end the last question. Uh, what have you learned about yourself that you feel is going to be most important for you um, to kind of carry with you uh, when you do return to normalcy? You know, throughout my career in life, I've always, I, I do take risk. I'm an entrepreneur, but I'm always, you know, I never take things for granted in terms of resources. And I think that uh, these things, this came out of the blue. 
And so I think from a personal, but also business perspective as a manager, um, I'm even, I'm, I'm even, I'm, I'm even more resilient in my thought that you always want to have a reserve, financial or emotional, uh, which means you focus, you focus, right? You don't, you don't crowd, your, you don't clutter your life with lots of distraction, at your, whether it's personal or organizational. And so I have a more appreciation for, for staying focused on the basics, staying focused on, the, on, on your blocking and tackling of what you need to get done. Because, you know, in this chaotic environment, there's lots of opportunity. And when you're really plugged into your purpose, your sort of why, then that can very quickly help you to, 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 to route out the noise and the chaos that's around you. And while everybody else is sort of paralyzed by either having made very, very risky decisions and flying by the seat of their pants, or just emotionally paralyzed because they don't know where to focus, I have found that that discipline that I've sort of been blessed with, both in my raising and in the community I'm with at Indiana University, that's that's having payoffs now. So I'm just, uh, if anything, it, it makes me stronger in the in the beliefs that I had coming into this crisis, because it's those beliefs that are helping me as a leader, but also the folks that I lead uh, survive and make progress even through what is a very difficult time. Thank you very much, Professor Powell, um, not only for your insight into COVID, um, but also taking the time out of your day. Uh, I appreciate it greatly, um, and especially on behalf of Vogel's Ang Law. I hope to be in communication with you again sometime soon. Um, is there anything you'd like to add? No, I just I wish the folks listening to give a, stay, stay vigilant and healthy. And of course, go Hoosiers, right? Hey, I'll tell you, it seems like everybody's on the same side these days, but if you had to pick one side, it would be Indiana University, wouldn't it? Right. Of course, we can always, <laughs> we can always rally around the Cubs, too. So. Uh, yeah, I'm going to get myself into trouble here if I keep talking. Um, okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much once again, and um, I appreciate the time, your insight into everything, and look forward to speaking with you soon. Absolutely.